<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Lynn Quincy from Consumers Union. We're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar today. Um, today's topic is medical harm, the taxonomy that you've been waiting for. You are listening to the voice of Lynn Quincy. Um, I direct the Healthcare Value Hub here at Consumers Union, which is the policy and advocacy arm of Consumer Reports. Before we get to our uh, exciting lineup of speakers, we have just a couple housekeeping items that I want to go over. Um, all of our participant lines are going to be muted until we get to our question and answer session, and we actually have two of those uh, built into today's agenda. If you're having any technical problems, you can use the chat box um, on the right-hand side of your screen to let us know, or you can text or call Tad Lee at 703-408-3204 to let him know that you need some technical help. Um, so thank you, and let's go ahead and uh, find out more about what we're talking about today. Uh, so first, we're going to hear from Lisa McGifford, who directs our Safe Patient Project here at Consumers Union, and she's going to unpack some basic concepts. Medical harm is amazingly common. It's the third leading cause of death, but very little she's going to tell us about uh, little is done to measure, study, and address the full spectrum of medical harm. And part of this is because there's uh, terrible ambiguities in the terminology which inhibits our ability to discuss this problem. Um, you're following Lisa and a question and answer period uh, we're about this, uh, the strategies to uh, undress, address medical harm. We're going to hear from, hear from Francois de Bronc from the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute. He has um, a specific strategy that he's going to be deploying, and he's working with our final speaker, Susan Smith, with New Hampshire Voices for Health, and they're going to talk, uh, both talk about what this strategy is and how they uh, anticipate deploying it in New Hampshire. And then we'll have a second opportunity for questions and answers. So um, with that brief introduction, I'd like to go ahead and get started. I'd like to turn it over to Lisa McGifford. Lisa, it's all yours. Thanks, and thanks everyone for attending this webinar. I hope we can energize you to seek opportunities in your states to work on ending medical harm. To set this up, it's important to understand the scope of this problem. Uh, the numbers are often overwhelming and sometimes unbelievable, but most agree that data available today probably underestimates the problem. Most of what we know about, is about medical harm is related to hospital care and harm from that care. There were three very reliable studies in the past 10 years that found, each of them found one in four, another one found 27%, and the third one, one in three hospital patients were harmed. They didn't look at preventability, they didn't all look at preventability, and they all looked at all types of harm. Uh, the important thing about preventability to remember is that it changes over time through experience and with new strategies and new technology and research. Most measures and the data they yield uh, look only at the most serious harm, and this leaves a lot of people out who eventually recover, sometimes after months and months of pain and suffering, and sometimes after a simple regimen of antibiotics for uh, and uh, an infection. Still, harm has happened, and often that harm, the, the impact of that harm depends on the condition of the patient. So uh, patient safety is not something that most people think about all the time, uh, and many would rather not think about it at all. But when you anchor it to compare, by comparing it to drunk driving deaths, it uh, becomes really concrete to consumers. So part of our job is to give them that perspective. And when you look at the, the, the deaths um, from drunk driving, uh, and, and probably that number has come down significantly since MAD has been very active, it gives you a sense that something really can be done about the problem. So today our goal is to introduce you to terminology that is used regarding medical harm, as Lynn said. And here are how two well-known organizations that work on patient safety define medical harm. 
an injury related to medical management in, con in contrast to complications of a disease, and the unintended physical resulted, resulting from or contributed to by medical care that requires additional treatment or that results in death. Another term that you might hear of is iatrogenic harm. Uh, and that is a, uh, comes from a Greek term and is used to refer uh, to when a patient acquires a new illness or is injured by services provided by a medical, medical provider. Um, so the concept of medical harm has been around uh, since uh, early Greek uh, days. So when we, when we talk about medical harm, these are the kinds of events we are including. Serious reportable events defined by the National Quality Forum and vetted and endorsed by experts in patient safety measurement are standardized, universally defined terms for preventable clinical events that cause serious patient harm. Uh, a lot of people also call these never events because they never should happen. And some of the examples of um, these uh, serious reportable events is surgery on the wrong part of the body, an object left inside a patient after surgery, or serious bed sores. There are some SREs that are not related to medical uh, harm, uh, and we don't usually include them in our list. Um, they include things like patient abduction, uh, sexual assault of a patient. The next category is medication errors, and it's a common subset of medical errors. Um, this can happen during ordering drugs, administering drugs, transcribing, and dispensing uh, drugs at the pharmacy. Uh, a common surgical-related medication error, error would be a labeling error, incorrect dosages, or medications that should have been given but were not given. These are distinct from what we uh, call adverse drug reactions, which um, are typically uh, reactions from a drug that's been prescribed like a side effect or an allergic uh, reaction. The other category that's included here is um, hospital-acquired conditions and sometimes called healthcare-acquired conditions. The federal law specifically defines these as conditions that cause injury to patients and could reasonably, reasonably have been prevented through the application of evidence-based guidelines and are high cost or high volume and have been coded uh, in a way that leads to higher pay payments for the hospital. This, this term is used for Medicare programs. Uh, and CMS regulations define which types of events are included in, um, in what we call hacks. Uh, hacks include uh, some medical errors and some hospital-acquired infections, and they are used by public and private payers in hospital reimbursement. So um, here's a figure that we put together to try to show you how these events uh, kind of overlap and don't overlap with each other. Uh, and this graphic is included in the taxonomy, so you can refer back to it if you want. So uh, when you look at medical harm, we include these uh, categories. Medical errors, uh, which is kind of an overarching term that's used interchangeably with a lot of other terms. You might hear the term uh, adverse events. Uh, a lot of people like to use that term. Um, and the 1999 Institute of Medicine study defined uh, medical errors in, in this way, and I, I'll let you read it and see it. Um, the other category is healthcare-acquired infections, which are basically, simply put, infections that are not associated with the reason a person uh, is in the hospital or sought healthcare. Uh, we also have adverse events that are connected with medical devices or prescription drugs and um, diagnostic errors. Many of these terms have a precise meaning based on the law or program that created them. For example, when used with programs that tie payments to specific types of events. So in that technical context, these terms are not perfectly interchangeable when, uh, when you're talking about medical harm. Um, 
So let's talk about uh, healthcare acquired infections, uh, often abbreviated as HAIs and often called um, hospital acquired infections too because that's where most of the work has been done. And these infections alone provide a dizzying number of terms that can be highly technical and difficult for the public to understand. Uh, simply put, these are infections that are not associated with the reason that the person went in the hospital, like we said before. The CDC estimates that at least 70% of hospital-acquired infections are preventable. And that number has significantly changed over the past 10 years. And many hospitals today are adopting a goal of zero hospital-acquired infections. There are several other common terms that are used in medical circles. Nosocomial infections is one of them, and healthcare-associated infections. We prefer to use hospital-acquired infections uh, because it's uh, a lot more clear what we're talking about. Uh, also, uh, HAIs are typically defined in precise epidemiologic terms. For example, when the infection was identified, determines whether it's healthcare-acquired or community-acquired. And they're also often de defined by the devices or procedures associated with them, as you can see on this list here. So um, HAIs are also described by the type of bacteria that causes them. Uh, and there's a lot of attention today on antibiotic-resistant infections. Uh, MRSA is a common one. CRE is one that uh, you may have read about recently. Uh, uh, called the nightmare bacteria. It's estimated that 40 to 50 percent of the people who get CRE will die from it. Um, there, is, uh, there is no antibiotic available to treat this bug. Uh, and um, another, uh, another type of infection that is linked to overuse of antibiotics is uh, C. difficile, and that has recently been put on CDC's urgent threat list, um, and you probably have heard some about that. Uh, often, um, the, uh, these antibiotics are used unnecessarily or inappropriately. The CDC estimates that as many as 50% of the time they're used inappropriately in hospitals. So let's talk a little bit more about hacks, and to make this category even more confusing, there are different programs that define hacks in different ways, although there can be some overlap. The CMS has a hospital-acquired condition non-payment program uh, where there are 10 preventable mistakes where for hospitals uh, uh, that hospitals will not receive additional payments for treating injured patients. So if the hospital injures a patient, they're not going to get more money uh, for treating them. Uh, and the federal regulations, by the way, also uh, prohibit hospitals from seeking payment from patients for, uh, for those, uh, those injuries. Uh, and this is the category that meets those conditions that I read earlier uh, about uh, the high volume and clinical uh, evidence-based practices that can prevent them. Then there's another hack program called the Hack Reduction Program. And that one reduces medical payments across the board to hospitals that score in the lowest quartile in the nation on a, on a completely different group of uh, mistakes. Uh, that group includes um, infections and some medical errors, but not the same ones as in the prior uh, HAC program. You may have seen some news yesterday on this program when um, CMS announced that 758 hospitals were fined. 54% of those are repeaters from last year, so there's a bit of improvement. Uh, and 45% of the teaching hospitals were fined. Uh, this is a large percentage of that category of hospitals, but that um, also means that 55% of teaching hospitals were performing well enough to stay off this list. And um, uh, recently, we've seen more of these um, healthcare-acquired conditions applied to non-hospital settings like dialysis centers and some home health, and I think we'll see more of that coming in the future. Uh, the ACA also mandated state adoption of similar Medicaid payment programs, uh, and they are called by, 
provider preventable conditions or other provider preventable conditions, um, which include other providers than hospitals. And CMS identified a minimum set of events that had to be included, and each state then defines and incorporates it in their own way. So I'm not going to really go over this chart. It's in the taxonomy also. But hopefully you can see that there are a lot of unknowns here, question marks, and that the known numbers are very high numbers with regard to incidents, deaths, and costs. But recognize that no one is really measuring all harm, and even those areas where there is widespread public reporting, like hospital-acquired infections, we are only getting the tip of the iceberg. Most of the statistics we have are extrapolations from small data studies uh, and um, you know, small sampling of uh, types of uh, infections, for example. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to questions. So um, thank you so much, Lisa. I know I have several questions. Uh, this is the voice of Lynn again. So for our participants who have a question, you can do, um, we're a pretty small group. So I invite you to either type your question into the chat box or personally unmute yourself by pressing star six. We'll skip over the raise hand protocol for now if, um, you know, because I, I suspect you won't be talking over each other. So while we're waiting for people to, um, so please interrupt verbally with a question or type it into the chat box. Uh, while we're waiting, I have a, uh, a question for you, Lisa. So I think that the number of blanks in the um, prior chart, oh, first of all, let me clarify, the taxonomy that Lisa referred to is um, a fairly new issue brief that we brought out in November. We'll be uh, showing you how to get it at the end of this, or partway through the webinar. Um, and uh, it, it touches on all the same information that Lisa just spoke to. But taking you back to your table uh, that shows what we know about medical harm and where we have a lot of blanks, is there a, a particular uh, absence of information that you feel is perhaps most urgent to fill in and complete? Well, I think that um, there is a, a paucity of information about medical errors, um, serious or not. Uh, there are only uh, a handful of states that report on this, and there, there really is not a lot of uh, national reporting. There are some measures where people, where you can extrapolate, uh, you can take information from billing data and estimate certain uh, types of errors, uh, and that's really the only thing that's available. There's, there's no uh, real accountability on a day-to-day -day basis by the hospitals to have to report this. Okay. okay. Um, we have a question in the chat box, which I'm going to read for purposes of our uh, recording, and it's from Abby. If hospitals cannot receive payment for treating victims of medical harm, how do we know they will treat those patients adequately? <laughs> Thank you, Abby, for that uh, difficult question. Um, <laughs> There, uh, there is no way for us to be sure that those patients are treated uh, appropriately. And, um, and there are also uh, the people who believe that the hospitals, uh, once they figure it out that if they code a certain thing, they won't get paid for it, um, that, they, um, that they may not be coding for it anymore. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, there's no way to really uh, keep track of whether the hospital uh, provided care for these patients. I would also say uh, the very important part of this, this program that I didn't, didn't touch on, the non-payment is only for that current hospitalization. So it would be quite easy for a patient to leave the hospital, uh, and very often is the case the symptoms, symptoms of an infection would show up after they leave the hospital. And then that patient has to go back into the hospital. Uh, the the hospital will, that will not come under this non-payment program. So there are many ways to game the system. We personally, we you know, we believe that Medicare ought to be tracking these patients' care because there's a lot of cost to the errors, especially when you're talking about infections. People might have months and months of rehab, doctor visits, drugs, wound care treatment. 
all of that is being paid by Medicare, and we think the hospital should be on the hook for paying for all of that. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I invite Randy Oster, who also has a question, to use star six to unmute and ask your question. Okay. And I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. I can hear you Wonderful. fine. Okay, perfect. Um, my question has to do with uh, medication errors. It, it would seem that there's probably um, mistakes that are repeatable, that there's, hospitals are seeing the same mistakes by giving uh, medication errors. And, and I'm trying to understand why wouldn't they just try to correct this? In other words, what, what is the, if you're making the same mistakes and you can start to identify them, it should be easy to say, you know what, we, if we change our process, this would end. And I'm I just trying to get a sense of why they're not taking the ownership and fixing it, especially at the massive scale that it's at. Well, you're right. Um, these, uh, these medication errors have been known about for decades, and uh, there are some strategies that have been developed. Some of them are uh, technology using barcodes uh, to make sure that the right um, drug is going to the right patient. Um, there are less technical strategies just by having the person delivering the drugs to actually check the patient's name and make sure it's the same name. But these mistakes continue to happen. Um, my theory is that there's not a lot of accountability for medication errors. Uh, as far as I know, no one is publicly reporting them. Uh, nobody is tracking them. Uh, and I, I think that uh, it's one of, since it's one of the most common errors that occurs, uh, that there, um, there should be ways to catch it. Um, I was in on, N on an NQF um, committee uh, recently that looked at a measure uh, that actually had, uh, with electronic medical records, had a, a timer to where if, if, a, if the drug was ordered and then it was changed within a certain amount of time, it was determined by, that ho by the hospital that developed this measure as um, uh, flagging it as a possible uh, mis uh, medication error or um, you know, with something that, was, that was, um, would have been an error if it hadn't been caught. And, it, and so I think that there's, um, there are a lot of things that hospitals can do, and as far as we know, they are not all doing it consistently day to day, and that's what it takes to prevent these from happening. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Paul Lebrecht has a question in the chat box. How have you estimated error rates from administrative billing data? Um, the, uh, the error rates that we have in this chart is not from billing data. It is from the uh, studies that found, and, and we, use the, we use the mid range of one in four hospital patients being harmed. And then we took the number of uh, hospital admissions from the American Hospital Association, the most recent numbers, and uh, we calculated it from that. And uh, then we subtracted the infections from, from that number to get the number of errors. So it is a very crude estimate. Uh, I don't know of anyone who has used the measures. There are some measures called patient safety indicators that AHRQ has developed. And some states use those and report on those, and those are the things that are uh, extracted from the billing data. Uh, also, the hacks are extracted from Medicare billing data. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, well, I hope so. And then we have another one in chat that I'll read again for purposes of the recording. Oh, two more. Uh, Jill Zorn, are there examples of hospitals that have been able to get to virtually zero infections? If so, how do they do it? There are examples of hospitals that have gotten to zero, infect, uh, zero of certain types of infections. Uh, the one that we see the most is called CLABZ, the Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infections. Um, and especially in the ICU. Uh, and I think that we have seen zeros in those hospitals for a number of reasons. That is the one infection type that all the states require to be reported and the feds first required to be reported and first tied to a payment, you know, pay for performance program. So there was a lot of motivation to improve. Um, there also have been a number of uh, national initiatives 
to, um, to uh, teach hospitals how to prevent these kinds of infections. Uh, one of them that many of you may have read about was done by Dr. Pronovost at uh, Johns Hopkins, and it was called a checklist. And it was a pretty simple checklist, but they found that if people, if the hospitals use this checklist, every time when they're inserting a central line, and part of it is included, included in the checklist is removing the central line as soon as you don't need it, those, following those simple procedures every time uh, has led to significant reduction in, in CLABSIs. Uh, and, and likewise, all the other types of infections, uh, each one of them has a different strategy. For example, to, to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, which is a common uh, type of infection, you can raise the head of the bed of a patient, uh, a ventilator patient. You can uh, check it every day and make sure that they uh, that find out if they need to get off of the ventilator. Uh, you can give them what they call a, a, a sedation vacation, quit giving them drugs for a day and see, or for a couple of hours and see how they do. So there are different strategies for different kinds of hospitals. And what we see is the most successful hospitals are the ones that have a, a pretty all-encompassing comprehensive program. And they're not just doing it in one unit or working on one, one type of error or infection. They've got a very uh, coordinated system to oversee uh, medical harm. Lisa, thank you so much. We've actually got quite a few questions now. This is from, no, it's, okay, it's good. This is from John James. Is there any place for near misses in the reporting system? Um, there is, uh, uh, well, there are, is not a public reporting of near misses, but I know that there are a, a, quite a number of hospitals that track near misses. And what that means is kind of the example I gave before where you catch it before you actually make the mistake. Uh, and a real uh, conscientious hospital is looking at these near misses because those are flags at parts of the system that aren't working well, and they're just lucky that they caught it before somebody was harmed. Uh, there are many experts who believe we should count near misses because that's a more accurate uh, count of you know, mistakes. Uh, but there are others uh, like Don Berwick who spoke at an event yesterday and said you know, the real problem um, is not errors because every, uh, humans are involved and humans are gonna make errors. But the real problem is patient harm and one way to prevent patient harm is to prevent medical errors. So it was kind of an interesting way to uh, explain that. Uh, but near misses is, I think, a really important thing for hospitals to uh, uh, keep track of internally to, to prevent errors. Okay. I'm going to just um, ask you one more of the questions in the queue, and then we're going to move on with the program. We're going to have a second Q&A session, and also we'll try to answer as many as of them as we can right in the chat box. So I'm going to pick this one from Claire Mitchell. Have there been any attempts to address the issue through state legislation? If so, have they been successful? Um, well, uh, yes, there has been quite a bit of state legislation. Uh, I was going to talk, I'm going to talk about that in a minute with regard to public reporting. Uh, and, uh, but there, um, I think there are some states that have tried to uh, create requirements for um, following CDC guidelines, for example, uh, putting that in the statute. Uh, you, you really don't want the legislators to put really specific things in the law about what hospitals or physicians or whoever must be doing to prevent these errors. But, um, but you, uh, you know, you need some, you would want some blanket information that can be changed over time as um, as uh, terms change and technology improves and research improves the prevention of these errors. Hello? Sorry, uh, Lynn was muted. That was my okay. fault. I heard a bunch um, of dings, so I was, wasn't sure if I got disconnected. I think that's, uh, we hear dings when people come and enter yeah. and leave the call. So Lisa, I'm going to ask you to move on and talk a little bit about the strategies, which the questions have sort of gotten us into. 
And, um, and then we'll, all, we'll uh, hear from our other speakers and specifically what strategies they are pursuing. Okay, great. Um, I've, I touched on a public reporting. One of the, um, we think that uh, standardized, universal, mandated public reporting is a fundamental component of any strategy to address medical harm. Uh, practically, if there is no measurement, there's no way to determine that you're making progress. And an adage that is often used is what gets measured gets done. So beginning in 2003, Consumers Union pushed for state reporting of hospital-acquired infections, and more than 30 states passed these laws. Uh, and um, now the federal government requires hospitals in every state to report on these hospital infections. Um, you can find this information on state websites and on the federal hospital compare site. Uh, these are typically not very consumer friendly. Uh, but there are many other organizations now that are, are taking this government data, government collected data, and, um, and translating it into understandable ratings for their constituencies. Uh, my organization, Consumer Reports, uh, does that for consumers, and um, a group called LeapFrog does it for businesses, but they also make their information available to the public so you can look at, uh, at, that, at their ratings also. We'll see more of this in the future, uh, more translations. Um, and one of the things that I talked about, uh, I've talked about recently uh, with some of you is that um, the, uh, many people are using composite measures that give, give a fuller picture of what's happening to the, in the hospital rather than individual measures of different types of infections. So some other strategies that we think are pretty important in preventing harm along with public reporting is some kind of pay for performance uh, um, type of program where hospitals that are performing the poorest get, um, get some kind of um, penalty for that performance. The other component is education and training programs for healthcare providers. And there are, um, many of you may, have, may be familiar with Partnership for Patients, which is a national program uh, that the Obama administration initiated across the country to train hospitals and get them to track their improvement. Uh, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is a really good resource for hospitals on how to reduce harm. And it also can be a good resource for uh, consumer advocates to see what kinds of things hospitals should be doing. Um, another more recent in the last, I don't know, five years, I guess, more, more and more in the last couple of years, uh, initiative is to involve patients in hospital trainings and in policy making at the hospital level. Um, Massachusetts, for example, requires that every hospital have a patient and family council. Uh, and uh, uh, many hospitals are adopting these councils to advise them. Uh, and some hospitals are also putting patients on their boards. Uh, and I think that is a good strategy also. And I would say the best the best patients to be involved in these are patients who've been harmed because they have seen where the problems are and they can um, highlight that for uh, the hospitals. So what can state advocates do? Um, you can engage people who have been harmed. It's the single most important thing to do. Their stories, uh, when they talk to the media and talk to legislators, can really move, move this issue along. Uh, you can familiar, familiarize yourself with um, the resources that are available, like the state reports and the federal reports, and, um, and know what's there so you can communicate that to the public. And you can push for more reporting and better reports uh, that people can understand. Uh, one thing that I think state advocates can really help on is to monitor and call attention to the Medicaid programs, uh, Medicaid pay for performance programs, because we don't really know a whole lot about what's going on with those. Uh, we, uh, we would encourage people to use social media to call attention to these state and national ratings uh, in the local communities. Uh, we have had great success when we focus on that, and that's something you can do. It's not a, it doesn't cost a lot of money, and it can really raise awareness in the public about your local hospitals or your state hospitals. Um, 
And, um, and there are other areas where you can get direct public information that's available um, in the states uh, from licensing agencies and uh, medical boards to see which doctors are on probation, for example. Um, those are also sources of information. So as I said before, most of what we know about is harm that happens in hospitals. But errors and infections happen throughout the system, and we don't have much information available about these yet. Uh, and you just need to be aware of that. And uh, Francois is going to talk to you a little bit about uh, complications uh, from physician care. So I'll pass it on to him. All right, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, briefly, here are some resources that you uh, probably saw in your connected to the invitation reminder that we sent out, and we will obviously not hide them. We'll make them readily available. So, um, and the slides will be available so you have Lisa's contact information. I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Francois de Bronc from the Healthcare Incentives Improvement Institute. We are very lucky to have him. Um, he had a terrible time dialing in, but I understand he's on the line now. Francois? I should be. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank goodness. Do you um, see the uh, arrows for advancing your slides at the bottom of your screen, or would you like me to advance them? Oh, you do. All right. I turn it over to you, Francois. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, yes, uh, what, <clears throat> as Lisa mentioned, there are lots of different ways and lots of different organizations that are trying to get a handle on measuring these uh, indicators of harm to patients, and uh, it's not easy because there's no single uniform way of looking at patient harm. Um, there are uh, very specific indicators, as uh, Lisa has mentioned, and then um, uh, there are more uh, commonly used measures, such as uh, for years, uh, researchers have looked at things like ambulatory care sensitive condition hospitalizations, which is a big term that simply means patients who have uh, conditions that normally should be ma managed in an outpatient setting end up by being hospitalized. Think of that as a failure of the system, right? So if you've got a well-controlled chronic condition, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, you shouldn't have to end up in the emergency department every other day. Um, and while that's an exaggeration, we do see instances in which patients who have these chronic conditions do end up by having acute exacerbations fairly often. Um, and so that's really what we've tried to do in looking at this um, relatively broad definition of what we refer to as potentially avoidable complications. So you'll see the acronym in these slides of PAC or PAC, um, and that stands for potentially avoidable complications. And this year, as part of our uh, general work, uh, we've uh, designed a measure that we call the risk standardized PAC rate. So there's another acronym for your um, uh, lexicon of complex uh, healthcare acronyms, which is the RSPR. So broadly speaking, what are potentially avoidable complications? Uh, it's all the stuff that, that, that Susan uh, talked about and, and then some. So there, in, in the simplest definition, it, it results from either the poor control uh, or the poor management of a condition, illness, or injury. So even if you think about the um, uh, infections from central bloodline um, uh, um, catheters, uh, th that's, a, that's the treatment of a patient during a specific condition and poor control of or, or management of that condition within that specific setting. A hospital results in an infection, results in some level of complication for the patient um, that anyone looking at it objectively would interpret and saying, wow, that's something bad that happens to that patient. Now, whether it's the patient's fault or whether it's the physician's fault, that's not the issue. The issue is there was a failure somewhere in, in, in the definition that the Institute of Medicine gave us over, over 15 years ago. There's a failure in the system that resulted in something negative, a negative event happening to the patient. So that's really what PACs are. They also include complications um, uh, resulting for treatments, procedures, and patient safety related uh, events. So how big is this problem? Um, it's very large, and it, it's, it's also um, not uh, uh, systematic or consistent across treatments and procedures. And we do a lot of measurement of these avoidable complications. We also quantify them monetarily. 
So uh, this chart represents for a payer the volume of dollars that are consumed by avoidable complications for specific treatments and procedures. The good news on, on, on this chart, if there, if, there are, if, there, if there are some, is that for the most part, we don't see that many avoidable complications in the procedural world. And that's mostly because now many procedures have become uh, very routinized and a lot of progress has in fact been made in the management of those uh, procedures. So for example, if you look at colonoscopy, there are very few uh, uh, um, complications avoidable complications that result from uh, colonoscopies, but there are some, and when they do occur, they actually happen to inflict a relatively high degree of harm to patients. So it is billions of dollars every year, and beyond the dollars, it's also harm to patients. So this is definitely an area, and I think this is important for advocates to understand, this is an area where higher costs to the system and to the patient are also um, uh, uh, the, are the result of patient harm, right? So better quality resulting from a reduction in avoidable complications um, will also result in a reduction of costs and therefore a greater affordability of healthcare. And there's also a lot of variation, as you can imagine, um, uh, by physician or by facility. So here's an example of um, this uh, risk standardized uh, rate of complication, which is on the vertical axis, and then on the horizontal axis is the average annual cost of managing patients with a particular condition. In this instance, it's asthma, and every single one of these dots represents a physicians, and we've only retained in this particular chart physicians who have a sufficient number of patients that you can reliably say, statistically reliably say, what is your rate of complication? Because right? you can't really calculate a rate of complication on five patients. Um, that's not an adequate sample. Uh, but you can if you have 30, 40 patients, uh, and that's determined by statistical analyses. So what this chart shows you are several things. One is that um, uh, some physicians do a lot worse than others. So understanding that variation and being able to highlight it and to help consumers understand that if they go to some physicians, they have a six out of 10 chance of uh, suffering some level of complication during the course of the year uh, in the management of their underlying condition. And other physicians do a very good job, um, one in 10, and, I, and while that seems high, when you look at a chart like this, that's a really low number, right? So yes, it's not great. You would hope that there would be close to zero, but that's almost impossible. Um, but there's something better than obviously having a one in two or one in three or one in six uh, patients who end up by having some kind of a avoidable complication. So number one, there's a lot of variation. Number two, much of that variation results in also results in higher costs of care. So when you look at this chart, while it, it's very much a scatter, um, uh, there also are uh, areas where it's not that much of a scatter. And, you know, you can see that there are areas where you have relatively lower uh, costs. And um, uh, I don't know if I can, yeah, right here. So relatively lower costs. Um, and, and relatively lower rates of complications. And this area here, where you have far higher uh, uh, costs of care and higher rates of complications, and then everything in between. So first, again, this emphasizes that when you only look at price or cost, you might actually get a, what we think about as a false positive, because here you've got physicians who are relatively low cost, but they have high rates of complications. And in other instances, when consumers think that higher price is always better because it's an indica indication of better quality, well, here you have physicians who have relatively higher costs, but they also have higher rates of complications. So creating a balanced view that accounts for both what is going to be, if I'm a patient and I have asthma, how much money am I going to have to spend? And in a high deductible world, most of my asthma care is going to be spent out of pocket. So where am I going to get the best value? And it's not necessarily with physicians here. It's much more with physicians in this quadrant right here. So how do I identify them? And by the way, when we say risk standardized, it means that we've looked at the relative 
um, level. The, so we've accounted for differences in conditions, severity of illness, all those other things that might explain some of this variation. And what you have left is unexplainable variation, right? So things that um, uh, are more due to maybe the way the physician's electronic medical record system works or how proactive the nurses are in reaching out to the patient and getting them back in and helping them figure out how to use their bronchodilators and just avoiding the complications that otherwise can occur for patients with this condition. And we see this type of scatter plot, by the way, for pretty much everything. Again, a little less when you're looking at procedures, but for the management of, of, of chronic conditions, it, it, it's not a pretty picture. So what's our plan? Um, well, number one, the good news is that we can measure rates of complications, as I said, adjusted for patient sickness and overall health by physician or facility for many conditions and procedures. Now, what you can measure is, in fact, um, limited by whether or not there's enough sample size. So that's why one of my continuous refrains is the importance of having all payer claims databases because that gives you the volume of data that you need by physician, by facility uh, to get to these types of important uh, indicators of, of quality. Um, we plan to start in, in, in releasing some of this, these data in New Hampshire. Uh, why? Because we have the state's all payer claims. A, they have a very good all payer claims database. We, we happen to have it and, and C, um, uh, in our application to get the um, New Hampshire all payer claims database, we were very specific in our request in specifying that we would be using it to do exactly this, measure the cost of care for certain procedures and conditions, look at things like avoidable complications, measure those and their rates, and then publish uh, the results of those analyses at the physician level or at the facility level. So uh, when we go around and we, 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 we apply for these APCDs, we're always very careful in our application to, be, to make sure that we say, hey, here's what we're going to use it for. Right? We're going to use it for transparency purposes. So if you allow us to use the, your data set for that purpose, then this is what you ought to expect. Now, that being said, um, uh, as you release information like this, which we know many physicians and facilities are going to freak, freak out about, we want to be sensitive to what is going on locally um, and make sure that this advances the cause of transparency rather than sets it back. So that's why we're working closely with uh, Susan Smith from New Hampshire Voices for Health um, so that we can manage uh, the stakeholder input, we can manage the rollout, and really try to create a model for the rest of the country. And, and here you have um, the um, URL for our full report. Um, and with that, let me uh, pass it over to Susan so that uh, she can give you some highlights on how uh, she plans to work with various stakeholders in the state. Susan, um, unmute and please go ahead. The spotlight is on you. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. No one um, disputes that the costs associated with medical harm, both on the personal and the financial perspective, um, are high, and that we need to improve the quality of care and lower the cost. As Lisa pointed out, there are strategies to address medical harm that include public reporting, pay for performance, health provider education training, and involving healthcare consumers in policy making, which is near and dear to our heart at Voices. All of these strategies are important and should be utilized to improve the quality of care and to lower cost. In the area of public reporting, Francois has identified an area of medical harm, potentially avoidable complication, and has developed a reporting tool that uses the all-payer claims database and risk, risk standardization to calculate outcomes of patient care at the provider level that he looks to use the Hampshire as a model for the rest of the country. This is very, very important, um, an important tool in the toolbox of consumers. I think we're all in agreement that consumers are key stakeholders in health system reform and that they need a balanced, accurate, and full picture of actionable quality indicators. 
New Hampshire, like other states, has some barriers to providing useful information for consumers without overwhelming them so that they can make informed decisions. So some of the barriers that we've seen um, in New Hampshire as we're working with Francois include pushback from providers who, as Francois alluded to, they're just not ready for their individual data to be published. There's also a concern about pushback from consumers who um, could be very unhappy if uh, a report comes out that doesn't uh, agree with them that uh, their, their provider is a stellar person and um, they don't want anybody saying that they're not. There's definitely a knowledge deficit on what the data is, the methodology that was used, and what it re uh, represents. In New Hampshire, we have a current provider payment, provider payer environment that is uh, causing some difficulty. And again, like a lot of other states, there's some potential uh, bureaucratic concerns about releasing certain identifiable information, uh, even at the physician level. In New Hampshire, uh, we, we take a collaborative approach and have a long and effective history of bringing all stakeholders to the table in collaborative efforts. One such effort is our statewide health improvement collaborative that for the past 10 years has been working on health system reform with transparency being a core value. Our New Hampshire Accountable Care Project is a collaboration of New Hampshire Citizens Health Initiative that brings together stakeholders including providers, commercial payers, policymakers, and consumers. And the project uses claims and clinical outcome data and works to support increasing publicly available reports using this information. We have a New Hampshire Health Cost website, and that's constantly being updated, and in January we'll be including quality measures. So our strategy for increasing publicly available information that consumers can use is through continued broad stakeholder engagement, education, and support. We need to increase understanding and decrease defensiveness around reporting. Um, we look forward to working with Francois in this collaborative effort to utilize provider quality information to move New Hampshire to greater transparency in healthcare cost, quality, and value reporting. Susan, thank you so much. Um, it's, this is going to be exciting to see how this plays out. I would like, uh, we have a few minutes left, seven to be exact. I'd like to invite the participants to um, ask some more questions. Um, and please, again, feel free to unmute. We're a pretty small group by pressing star six. And um, I think while I'm waiting for a question for Francois and Susan to show up, Lisa McGifford, let me ask um, a question that's in the queue from before. Laura, Lauren asks, what happens if the mistake is caught by the patient or family caregiver rather than the medical professionals? Um, uh, Lauren, I'm assuming that you're thinking about near misses when you ask that question. Um, and I think uh, a good hospital uh, that has a, a, a very conscientious program to catch near misses would also count near misses caught by the patient and the family uh, and probably would have some kind of policy for the uh, healthcare workers to uh, to identify those also. Uh, for example, if the healthcare worker was trying to give medications to the wrong patient and the patient stopped them, then that worker should have to report that near miss. But it's okay, all thanks. an on honor system, frankly. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, Paul Lebrecht, I invite you to unmute and ask your verbal question. Star six? Hmm. Can't hear you yet, Paul. Okay. Okay. There oh, there you, you are. Can you hear me? Great. Yep. Uh, yeah, about measuring the PACs in an APCD database. So looking at New Hampshire, uh, for example, do you have Medicare claims in your APCD or what? Generally, there's 
you know, some claims may be small, small employers, Medicare, some things are not going to be in there. So how do you propose to generate a good benchmark from the APCD against which to measure uh, PACs? Yeah, it's a great question, and actually also allows me to answer uh, Jill's question um, uh, at the same time. Uh, the, the way we're approaching the measurement of these complications is data set by data set, which creates a little bit more of a homogenous representation of populations. So, for example, separating out Medicaid from Medicaid or from commercial. Now, to your point, it reduces sample sizes, and so it precludes, for example, the measurement of certain conditions or procedures that you might be able to measure if you aggregated data across all three populations. But the methodological uncertainty that you introduce by mixing and matching Medicare, commercial, and Medicaid um, would significantly impact the legitimacy of the measurement. So you can't measure everything, and I think that's the point. But but um, uh, we can measure a lot, a lot more than what's being measured today. Um, and so we're not going to be able to get to rates of complications for patients who have leukemia, uh, but we can get to rates of complications for patients who have diabetes, for patients who have asthma, for patients who have COPD, heart failure, et cetera. And the reason we're doing a data set by data set is because the severity of the populations are different. So when you're calculating expected costs of complications, uh, when you're analyzing a Medicaid data set, you're going to have a higher expected, whether it's right or wrong is not the issue, but you are going to have a higher rate of expected complications for, for children with asthma and Medicaid than you do in commercial, and obviously you have no kids with asthma in Medicare. So uh, it, it's over time what you want to do is you want to be able to, um, uh, uh, again, the extent to which you have enough data, you want to be able to show what the differences in those rates of complications are by population type and then work towards reducing them. But we need to accept the fact that even with APCDs, there are certain conditions, procedures, others that we will not be able to measure with statistical rigor, and so we won't. And Francois, were you going to tackle uh, Jill's question about whether or not whether you considered adjusting for socioeconomic status or race? Yeah, and so that's what the, that's the reason why we're splitting off the populations between commercial Medicaid and and Medicare because when you look at the literature today around how do you differ, how do you adjust for socioeconomic differences, uh, no one's been able to come up with a better way uh, at this point than by using insurance type as the proxy for socioeconomic differences. So looking at the, the expected and, and creating a rate of complications for the Medicaid population separately than commercial, separately than Medicare, uh, is, the better, is, the, is the best way today to account for those differences. Oh, thank you for that clarification very much. Um, so Terry says, I think this would be a question for all of the panelists. I represent a nonprofit patient safety awareness program in Colorado. We find it a challenge just to bring the attention of bring attention to the problem of medical error and patient safety, particularly in outpatient settings. How can we get it to the forefront of the healthcare conversation? Looking for suggestions. Um, this is Lisa, and uh, I think uh, this will answer Kathy Day's question too. Um, I really believe that the way to get attention is through patient stories and figuring out different ways to use those stories uh, and to engage those uh, people who have been harmed or lost a loved one to medical harm. <clears throat> this is the best way to sort of illustrate the real impact as opposed to just giving a bunch of statistics. So I would say that is the best way to get attention. And I think you have to come up with creative ways on how to use the stories and not just publish a bunch of stories, but use them very strategically when you need to. Uh, for example, you might have somebody who's a constituent of a um, powerful legislator and you go in to meet with them with a patient who has a story. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Francois or Susan, do you want to add anything? is a really important question. This is Susan. I think one of the things that we are doing is trying to bring the forefront of what is really happening in the healthcare system uh, along uh, 
uh, the broad spectrum of cost and quality. And we, you really have to get it down to the individual level in order to build up enough momentum to make it so that people will start paying attention and it does become at the forefront of discussion and action. Yeah, and look, I, the only, my only comment would be look at the dollar signs that I showed on, on the charts. Uh, it, I think you can get people's attention, employers and, and any payer and even providers in understanding that this harm results in very high costs for patients. And, um, and that's, you know, there's an ethical reason to pay attention, but there's also a, a financial reason to pay attention. Okay. Um, I'm going to put up two, uh, two polls asking folks to evaluate, if you don't mind filling the, them out while we ask our final questions. Uh, Yan Ling Yu asks, a question regarding RSPR. What happens when a medical error – oh, I think you answered this. Well, let's answer it verbally for the recording. What happens when a medical error worsens patient's existing health conditions, making him more sick or worse dead? Do you want to just answer it, answer it verbally, Francois? Uh, sure. And so the, the, the quick answer is uh, waiting these complications is uh, very, very, very challenging. Um, and, uh, and so while it, clearly it, 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 it would be a, a good next step, uh, we also know that we would be spending an inordinate amount of time trying to explain why something is weighted slightly higher or slightly lower than something else. So the first pass at this is, Harm is harm, and while we know that sometimes more harm results from certain things than others, uh, it, it, it's, um, it was a judgment call to say we're just going to treat them equally for now. Okay, thanks. I'm going to um, – well, actually, I see we're at our three, past our 3 o'clock mark. I'm going to put up um, our final poll. Oh, I think it was closed. Anyway, I won't worry about the poll. I'm gonna, I apologize for the couple questions we didn't get to. Uh, we're going to have the slides and contact information available for the speakers. I want to thank everyone who joined us today for this really important conversation. Um, I think a, ver a place where we can uh, really attack the value proposition, as you heard from our speakers. And um, I invite you to keep the conversation going. And with that, I'm going to end the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.